here today to share with us uh, some information about diagnosing lawn problems. And since we're already eight minutes in, Sam, go ahead and take it away. Sure. That sounds good. So, uh, thanks for the introduction there, Andrea. Sorry about the technical difficulties here. Uh, I think we should be all set to go now. Um, so the topic I want to discuss here uh, this afternoon is diagnosing lawn problems. I've received quite a few questions uh, this year about how to actually, you know, what is the process that I use to go about trying to identify what specific issue is that one of your uh, customers or clients or, you know, a property owner might be dealing with in their lawn or landscape. So uh, we have a lot of information to get through here. I think we'll just leave uh, questions till the end and we're just going to dive into it then. So the basic uh, overview of the session that we're going to go through here, uh, first I want to talk about some common problems that we see in lawns and we really separate these problems up into either the abiotic problems, which would be uh, non-living type of stresses like salt damage on boulevards or flooding type of damage um, and also the biotic problems, so, so those living uh, plant stresses that we see. I'm gonna, uh, you know, what I have in my tool bag that I use to help try to diagnose some issues and then also I have several uh, checklists here that I'm going to share with you that you can use when you do go visit uh, a homeowner uh, try to diagnose some issue that they're experiencing in their life. Then we're going uh, to uh, wrap everything up with the uh, seven-step uh, process uh, to diagnosing lawn care issues, and this is the process we're going through. Uh, you know, when the issue in the lawn is not clearly obvious uh, of what it might be. <clears throat> Common problems in lawn. So, just a basic, you know, high-level overview here of, of lawn problems. We mentioned so abiotic and biotic stresses. The abiotic again are those non living plant issues that we see. This urine is a, a, a and that I get quite often um, is an abiotic type of stress. And one of the main indicators here um, that lets me know this is uh, actually a pet urine damaged area is uh, the reason these spots die from the pet urine is because of the high nitrogen and the high salts in their urine. So with nitrogen, we see this bright green ring usually uh, around these dog urine spots. And actually, in some cases, uh, the nitrogen is, is not enough to, to kill the grass, and we actually have just a bright green uh, or a dark green uh, pad that we see from that urine. Now, we can separate that from some of our biotic or living uh, plant issues. Uh, this is just a fungus below here. Take all patch is what this, this fungus is. So we see in this case, we don't have a green ring around this patch type of disease. And actually, we can see we have necrosis or chloride plant tissue on the outermost edge uh, of this ring, which tells us that this disease is actually progressing and seeing some recovery in the center of this patch where the, uh, the pathogen has moved out from. Uh, biotic type of issues can really be separated up into uh, two main categories. So we have environmental uh, issues that can be abiotic, and then we also have management-related issues as well. So from an environmental standpoint, um, you know, the three main categories that I think about are, you know, different microclimates that we might have in lawns and whether that's a shaded type of situation um, or, you know, different slopes or topography changes. We also have these uh, heat sinks, which are quite uh, frequent in uh, urban type of areas. And by heat sink, I mean, you know, some area that's adjacent to a boulevard, you know, some type of impervious surface uh, or some, you know, south-facing slope as well. Those will be key indicators, you know, that we may be dealing with some type of heat rated stress, stress on our cool season grasses. We also have soil problems, which are abiotic type of stresses, whether it's nutrient deficiencies, uh, compaction type issues, and moisture stress issues uh, as well. And then, uh, Extremes and, and, and really we're looking at weather-based extremes here. So uh, temperature extremes, high and low temperatures, uh, flood type of damage. Certainly we saw quite a bit of this in June of uh, 2014, uh, probably a little bit in, in, in May of this year. And drought damage, which we saw very extensively in the book 2012 as well. Uh, management issues that are, you know, that can be abiotic stresses. So uh, two main categories here chemical damage and also mechanical injury. So chemical damage would be this pet urine one that we talked about. 
We also see uh, quite often herbicide damage, uh, you know, depending on what type of herbicide was actually applied, but if it was applied at the wrong timing or the incorrect rate or on species of grass, we can actually see quite a bit of damage from, from herbicide injury. And oftentimes that can be misdiagnosed as a type of disease issue that we might have in the lawn. But uh, anyway, definitely something I see quite often. And, and certainly we also have fuel uh, or oil spills that can be a chemical type of damage. Mechanical injury, uh, definitely, you know, related to any type of, of use that we have uh, on our lawn. So scalping, which is a mowing type of issue. We certainly have plenty of, of mowing issues that we see causing abiotic stresses, uh, excessive wear from traffic or, uh, uh, you know, people running or from vehicular traffic. And also, uh, in, in Minnesota, we see quite a bit of snowplow damage as well on the sides of the road and on some of our uh, driveways also, uh, the type of mechanical injury there. Overview of the biotic issues that we see in lawns. So uh, these can also be separated up into two main categories. So we have, you know, I would call just our general lawn pests. And then we also have pathogens uh, as well. So general pests could be anything from insects to animals or moths and algae. Uh, category of insects, we have both surface feeding insects, which would be in all cases, something like a sod webworm, uh, you know, some type of worm generally, or a chinch bug even would be a surface feeding type of insect. We'll have sub subsurface feeding insects. The white grubs are the main ones that we're thinking about with that. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, white grub issues that we see in lawns. Uh, also, uh, you know, we have damage from, from any of our vertebrates. So moles, bulls, and gophers can cause issues with lawns. Uh, and also, uh, in you know, shaded, wet type of situations. A lot of cases we can see uh, moss, uh, and, and we also certainly see algae in, in thin lawns, and then black layer can also be another uh, issue that we see in the soils, which, which is a type of biotic stress. Pathogens that we see, fungi was probably the main uh, pathogen that we're gonna be dealing with. So we can have uh, those pathogens that affect the foliage uh, of the plants only. We can have pathogens that affect both the roots and the foliage. And also we have uh, root only pathogens. Uh, pathogens separated up into to categories of bacteria, virus, you know, which really we don't see that much in issue with these in lawns. We did have some type of uh, bacteria and virus issues in the past, but usually uh, those issues can be overcome through breeding and breeding for resistance of some of these, these type of diseases there. Nematodes, which are microscopic worms, uh, essentially, that live in the soil, can also be injurious to, uh, to our lawn grasses. Uh, not an issue that we deal with quite often, but uh, if you've exhausted all of your, your references and your resources and really can't come up with the answer, uh, sometimes the nematode test uh, may be in order if the turf is really just looking fairly weak. So our abiotic problems are certainly often misdiagnosed as, as plant diseases. You know, people see a patch in the lawn and, 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 the, and they see it spreading or they see it multiplying. And, you know, a lot of times it, uh, disease is kind of the first thing that comes to people's mind. But I'll say I see quite a few more issues with a, abiotic problems than I do with biotic problems. Uh, abiotic problems, they can occur certainly uh, suddenly or uh, over a period of time as well. It just depends on what particular issue uh, that we're seeing is. You know, heat stress is something that can develop over time and some of the other type of damage like a, a mower stress or, uh, or urine damage can occur almost suddenly. Uh, our abiotic problems are going to have distinct patterns of damage. So really, uh, when you go in and look for some type of issue, if there is any distinct pattern to that damage, in most cases, it will be an abiotic type of stress. Uh, a, couple, uh, ones that, a couple of good ones that come to my mind would salt damage on boulevards. We can see uh, uh, progressively more dead turf and get closer to that, to that boulevard. And the turf damage reduces as we get further away from that boulevard. Uh, localized compression stress as well would be a typical pattern where people constantly walk or uh, maybe we even have pet, uh, you know, uh, rail pets travel quite frequently. Uh, straight lines of damage from equipment, mowing uh, is certainly a cause of this in many cases. If we have uh, 
sometimes uh, spray damage. Oftentimes you will see uh, you know, straight lines from that particular herbicide that was sprayed and from the application process. And then also poor irrigation performance, something certainly to look for uh, when we're looking for abiotic stresses in lawns. And there almost always will be some type of pattern associated with that poor uh, performance of your irrigation system. Just a couple of pictures here of some of the abiotic stresses that I see, you know, around quite frequently in Minnesota here. So this is that salt damage along the boulevard that I was referring to here. Um, you know, pretty uh, pretty dead giveaway of, of what the issue is, and we can see how uh, much the issue progresses as we get closer to the to the, uh, the road there. Uh, this is just a traffic damage from from pets uh, around that area of the house, so pretty easy issue to solve there. This is obviously uh, that those those patterns that I was talking about here with the more type of damage, and they have some mower uh, laid that was out of adjustment in this case. And, uh, you know, really don't need to follow the seven-step uh, diagnostic process for any of the ones that we just showed here. It's pretty obvious of what the issue is. Traffic damage that we see uh, quite often on uh, fine fescues in the middle of the summer. Uh, we can see uh, injury due to, uh, to traffic in, in high heat situations. Uh, that's what I'm showing there. Rough bluegrass, uh, which is the Latin name of this poetry of here. This is a plot out at the, uh, at, at the Landscape Arboretum. Uh, this is one species that particularly suffers from um, heat stress and sun stress uh, when it's out in open environments. So uh, usually if, if you have any type of, of rough bluegrass in your lawn, you will see this in July and August, and then usually growth would resume uh, in the fall of the year. Obviously, the, the mower damage, this is a photo from Bob Mugis here. Um, we can see the shredded leaf tips are uh, certainly an issue that we deal with with dull mowers and uh, mowers that aren't operating uh, as they're supposed to be. And, and certainly, we need to focus on uh, sharp mower blades, and obviously, that will improve the overall appearance of our turf and its resistance to some of these uh, both abiotic and biotic type of stresses. So just some good pictures of abiotic stresses there uh, see quite often. Now, attic problems, so we can, uh, the inf infectious agents of turf grass can be separated up into four major categories here. Uh, fungi, there are approximately 60 different fungi that might affect turf. In Holland, in Minnesota, we probably see about 10, I suppose, um, but it really depends on the time of year when we would be seeing, seeing those. We probably only see four or five at specific times of year. There are 22 that could affect turf, not really much of an issue that we see uh, in Minnesota on our cool season grasses, but just certainly worth noting. Next is there are eight uh, that can uh, can negatively affect turf. Here's a picture on the right side here of what the microscopic nematode, that uh, that ringworm, uh, looks like there. And bacteria, we have two that affect turf. And common fungi that I see in lawns, this is certainly not an, an all-inclusive list here, but these are probably some of the more common uh, issues that I see. Leaf spots are certainly around throughout all times of year. Rust disease, we're going to look a little bit more at that. Um, red thread is another issue that we see primarily in the spring and the fall. Now, rust, uh, red thread, and then dollar spot here. Dollar spot uh, usually starts to occur in small little, little, little spots. I'll show a picture of that. Um, but these, these main uh, three here, are usually indicators of low nitrogen in your lawn environment. So knowing which diseases are prevalent in some of these different uh, different situations certainly can be very important. Nitrogen is the main one we look at to determine, uh, try to determine what might actually be causing this disease type issue. And then the chronic ring spot as well. We're going to dive, uh, talk a little bit more about that particular disease there. Okay, here's just a close-up picture of red thread. This is a really extreme example of red thread affecting uh, Kentucky bluegrass turf, uh, I believe, in this case here. So uh, red thread, as I mentioned, is a low nitrogen disease, and usually recommendations would be to get a nice fertilizer application down, and the temperatures uh, warm up a little bit. Your turf should generally grow out of it. But uh, the, the red threads here would be what we call a sign of the pathogen actually being present there. So that's kind of a dead giveaway of what the issue is here uh, in this case. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how to identify uh, signs of some of these type of pathogens. 
echelon problems, uh, you know, just continuing here. So, so uh, certainly we see common uh, lawn insects, uh, white grubs are, you know, one of the main insects that we deal with. Here's just a picture uh, of a white grub that was affecting uh, a home lawn that I saw here this spring. So webworm and, and bluegrass billbug are both surface feeding uh, type of insects along with the dish bug as well. We can see that different times of the year. The sod webworm is usually going to have two to three generations per year. And we're going to talk about a test that you can do to try to determine if in fact have sod webworm affecting some lawns. Uh, inch bugs can certainly be an issue with some of our grasses as well. And then ants are kind of a nuisance pest uh, that we deal with in lawns. Pests certainly uh, moles, voles uh, as well. Voles are like a small field mouse. And you see vole damage when the snow uh, melts in the spring. And a lot of cases uh, that hold snow the longest will have the most damage from voles. So the bottom right picture here is just a picture of uh, you know, some, some vole damage here on campus. And, and we really see this uh, almost every year from, from that nuisance type of pest or uh, damaging type of pests. Skunks, raccoons, and gophers can certainly cause issues in our lawns as well. So this is a home lawn. This is uh, in Andover, where a gentleman had called me up because uh, he was experiencing some severe thinning of his turf and wondering, you know, and, he, and wondering what he could do uh, to try to uh, improve the quality of his lawn. He wasn't on a very good fertility program. He had an irrigation system, and in this case, it was Kentucky bluegrass. You know, the first thing I noted when I went to this site was he, he does have a pet. The, you see the dog urine spots here and how much those areas are actually greening up quite a bit from that dog urine, and it's actually not filling the grass. So, this, you know, the first thing that that kind of said to me is, uh, you know, possibly this, this thing area could be uh, a nutrient type of deficiency, especially due to the fact that these, uh, these areas are greening up quite a bit here. Uh, from the nitrogen that dog urine. Now, I spent a little bit of time in, in poking around the property and, and trying to see if he had more issues. I did not see any lesions on the grass at all. I didn't see any distinctive type of pattern. You know, only after about 10 or 15 minutes, I suppose, I started tugging at the grass a little bit. And what I found when I started tugging at the grass was, was uh, these white grubs. So grass would literally, and this is Kentucky bluegrass in this case, you could really pull up the grass almost like it was just sodded yesterday because of the damage that these white grubs were, were doing here. So, um, you know, usually we would say the threshold for, for white grubs might be three or four white grubs per square foot uh, of turf. It really depends on what the species of grubs that you have. Some grubs can be quite a bit bigger than others. In this case, we can, you know, we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of little uh, square foot area. So, and, and you can see uh, on the underside of the, the turf pulled up here, uh, there's actually no roots on the turf at all. So, uh, you know, this was a situation where I de identified the grubs as being the main issue that he was experiencing. Um, and, and really it was related to the soil type that he had. He had more of a sandy type of soil and the grubs really liked it. And it was different from his neighbors. They were really able to move around quite freely. But unless I would have were to pull on that turf, I, I really would have never uh, been able to diagnose this issue as being a white grub issue. Now, in case I identified the grubs as being both uh, May June beetle grubs and then also Japanese beetle grubs, so depending on what type of grubs you have, um, you, your control strategies might change a little bit. The, the issue with the May and June beetle grubs is they have one generation every three years. So any one time in your lawn, you can have multiple generations of these May June beetle grubs, and they can be very difficult to control because of their different stages of growth when you're trying to control them. Japanese beetle grubs have just one generation per year, and controls are, are more effectively able to target uh, when, the, when the larvae are, are becoming present. So uh, yeah, that's just an issue that I saw with the white grubs in this person's property there. So uh, just continuing on biotic problems here, uh, moss, algae, you know, uh, really don't need any investigative work to try to figure out the issues that, because they're, you know, fairly prevalent when we have them. Both the and algae are encouraged by wet conditions and compaction. So the recommendations in this case would be to try to reduce the soil moisture, recompaction. 
The moss is going to be more severe in shaded situations, also infertile and acidic soils. We're going to see more issues with moss. Uh, algaes are going to be more severe in, uh, I'm sorry, in, in full sun, it should say there. It's a typo. Oops. If there was here. Uh, algae is more severe in, excuse me, full sun situations and fertile soils. So that's the difference between moss and algae there. Sorry about that typo. So tool bags and checklists, I'll just go through what I have in my tool bag and some of these checklists that we use here. So uh, my tool bag looks kind of, you know, something like this. Uh, oil probes are really the most important thing that I bring with me every time. Uh, this one on the far right here is a soil profiler. So you stick that in the ground and it gives you a, a really flat view of the soil. This thing open, opens up so you can really get a good snapshot of what the soil uh, layers look like and even any difference between soil types on a particular property. I have just a large and small soil probe here as well. Uh, hand lens is certainly valuable to you to bring along. I like to bring along this macroscope here. Uh, it can be you know, particularly useful for trying to identify any type of turf disease uh, that we might be seeing. Uh, I like to bring bags for any sampling, whether you're going to conduct a soil test or you're going to bring uh, Jeeves plants back with you and maybe even submit them to a laboratory or look at some weed species for further identification. Bags are certainly very, very important to have. Uh, quick reference materials, so, you know, just a, maybe a, a broadleaf uh, uh, weed identification book and a grassy weed identification book. Little pocket-sized ones uh, can certainly be good to go in your uh, tool bag there. I have a moisture meter here as well. I usually I use that more so for golf courses than I do for home lawns. Um, but that can be a pretty uh, valuable tool here if, if your skills of, of determining moisture are not very good by uh, just the feel method. So uh, I do like that soil moisture meter. And then uh, I also have, you can see here, this height of cut gauge, which is this red one in the middle. Uh, so this stick into the ground and you can determine uh, their little measurements here to determine what the height of cut of the lawn actually is. And, you know, some of the weed issues or insect issues or even disease issues that we deal with might specifically be related to the height of cut that their grass is at. So knowing that can be uh, very helpful. This is just a turf check too is what it's called here. And then if I'm ever spraying anything or, uh, or trying to determine any type of weather conditions, usually bring along this anemometer here. So this has the wind, the relative humidity, uh, temperature measurements as well uh, in this little handheld device. It's my tool bag, and you all, all might have something, uh, you know, some other beneficial tools here as well, but these are just pretty much the basics that I carry along with me uh, to diagnose any type of issue. Now, I also have a, a pre presented questionnaire that I email to anybody who is looking to have uh, a, a lawn care issue assessed. And this is actually a three page questionnaire, so uh, need to try to fill it out as best as they can. We, I've provided it for you here. The link is on top of this PowerPoint here, and I believe Andrea has also posted this link uh, to this webinar, which you can print off and uh, even email off to, to somebody who's looking to try to solve an issue. It uh, should be in the chat box there. This is, gonna, this is gonna be filled out before you actually visit the property by the property owner or manager. And the reason for using this Pre-questionnaire is really provides a good background for you uh, prior to your visit, and maybe it will even indicate whether you need to uh, do a little research before you visit the property as well. And they're also very beneficial to uh, to avoid what I you know I'd call unnecessary site visits. So uh, property owners that actually sit down and take the time to go through this three-page document to fill it out are sort of showing you some initiative that they obviously have a vested interest in solving the issue that they're dealing with. They're not just looking for a free site visit uh, uh, from you. So, uh, you know, whether or not they actually take the time to fill this out can, uh, you know, can be important to determine whether or not you should actually be visiting that property. This is also meant to save you time in solving the problem. So, um, this that I have is, is pretty extensive. I use it for both uh, professional turf and for home lawns. You know, they don't need to fill out every single question. If they don't know the answer to it, it's not, not really good of a deal. But any, any specific information they can provide on here will only uh, help you in the long run to that, try to determine what their issue is that they're experiencing. We have lists that can be filled out uh, by you on site. This is actually one here 
that was provided to me from Dr. Aaron Patton at Purdue University. This is a two-pager here. The link is also posted in the chat box and it's up on top of the PowerPoint here. So it's filled out by you on site as you're assessing as you're assessing the site and as you're talking with the property owner. You might require some reference materials to have, to help you accurately identify what pests or what uh, weeds or insects they're experiencing on their site there. Uh, these forms have have blank spaces to fill out all types of information. So everything from the information, which would be, you know, the of cut, the frequency of mowing, the, uh, we have the, the, the species of grass as well, any weeds, diseases, or insects that you're seeing. Uh, you can include soil information on there, uh, whether or not you want to do a soil test and what the results from that soil test actually are. Uh, uh, microclimates, weather conditions, irrigation and mowing, anything that they conduct uh, their property can help you uh, determine what issues they're actually experiencing. Reference materials that I use, so these are just three, uh, three, you know, what I feel are really good books. They're all paperbacks, so you, you know, they fit nicely in your bag. Um, the Compendium of Turf Grass Diseases is one that I use quite often. This actually in the back of it has a key to try to help you identify what disease you might be experiencing. I use that uh, quite a bit. The diseases are, uh, are organized by what pictures they'll be occurring at. And then uh, the next part of the key deals with what the pattern of that disease actually looks like. So I've used that quite often. Uh, the book of Turf Grass Insect Pests, another uh, good paperback copy uh, to try to determine what insect issues you might be experiencing. And then of the North Central States is also another good publication to try to uh, determine uh, what some unknown uh, weed might actually be. Some good uh, drawings in that book there as well. Finally, we're getting into the seven-step uh, diagnosis process here. I'll try to move a little bit quickly uh, through this so we have time for questions as well. Uh, the first step that I always try to do is identify the host. And by the host, I mean you know which grass species is actually affected in, in the lawn. Now, many of the diseases that we experience in lawns can affect, you know, only, you know, one or two types of grass species, and they may not affect another. So the picture that I have on the right-hand side here, this is just our research center. What we have on the, on the left side uh, of this picture is all fine fescue, and that's uh, being damaged here in this case by a disease we call summer patch. On the right-hand side, we have creeping bent grass, and you can see that the disease uh, has not encroached into the creeping bent grass at all. So, so certainly determining what uh, species you're dealing with is the first step to determine what issue you might be experiencing. And then so uh, weedy grasses are often misdiagnosed as turf grass diseases. Oftentimes, uh, creeping bent grass and even the rough bluegrass will form patches in lawns and they'll look different at, at different times of the year. Uh, so being able to identify, you know, what those are actually different grasses and not diseases uh, can be very important to help try to solve the um, type of issue that they're experiencing. Uh, several different structures for identifying grasses. We have another link here for you as well. So this is a, a tool from Purdue University that helps with identifying turf grasses. You can go in and select, you know, all of the different characteristics of the grass that you're trying to identify and will hopefully uh, lead you to the correct identification of that grass. But we use uh, several different, you know, types of, I guess, what I would call appendages uh, for determining, uh, for distinguishing different species from, you know, one another. Uh, leaf tip is one main one that we look at. So, so uh, Kentucky bluegrass and actually all of your bluegrasses, annual bluegrass and uh, even, you know, southern bluegrass or rough bluegrass will have this bow shaped type of leaf tip. So when you run your finger over that leaf tip, it should split kind of like a, if everyone thinks of a, what a snake's tongue look like, that's what the boat shaped leaf tip would look like. And we have pointed leaf tips as well. Uh, almost all of our other species other than bluegrass will have uh, some type of, of pointed leaf tip. Perennial ryegrass, tall fescue, the fine fescues all have pointed leaf tip. So in, in most cases, if you do have a boat shaped leaf tip, you're gonna be dealing with uh, some type of bluegrass. In many cases, it would be Kentucky bluegrass. But then we also look at so how the leaves are actually situated in that stem. Are they rolled or folded in that stem? Will help us to differentiate the two. Ligule, which is just an appendage, uh, kind of at the collar, uh, the base of the stem and the leaf blade. Uh, some grasses can have uh, 
larger ligules than others, and some don't have any ligules at all, so that can help. Oracle, I'm going to show you a picture of what an oracle look like, looks like here. And then if you can let some of these, you know, if, if all else fails, uh, you know, an issue and we don't see any seed heads because of that mowing practice. So if you can let some of these species you're trying to identify actually go to seed, uh, it might be easier to identify uh, this is based on what those seed heads actually look like. Uh, you can grow them out if you're really being stumped by that particular uh, grassy weed. Uh, here's an example of an oracle. So we have two grasses that have what we would call these claw-like or clasping oracles. One is annual ryegrass, um, which we find in a lot of our quick repair mixtures. The one case here actually is quack grass. So uh, you can see that, that these appendages, these oracles, are these appendages that wrap around uh, from the leaf and the collar region here, wrap around the stem of the grass plant. And that would usually be a dead giveaway uh, that you're dealing with either quack grass or annual ryegrass. And ryegrass is an annual species, so not much to worry about there. The quackgrass is a perennial cool season grass and can be very difficult to control uh, in an existing cool season lawn. So this is the giveaway for quackgrass there. You really won't see clasping oracles on any of our other grass, uh, weedy grass species types. Two, after you identify the species you're dealing with, is try to identify what the symptoms are that you're experiencing. So the symptom is is the, basically the visible expression of plant's reaction to that particular um, to that problem. So we can classify these as either stand-based symptoms, which would be you know, symptoms across the, an entire stand or an entire lawn, or individual plant-type symptoms. When we get down and actually look closely at the leaf blades, we can see what the symptoms would look like on the individual leaf blades or on the crown or even on the roots of the grasses. Uh, diseases, uh, insects, and abiotic issues will generally have some specific type of issue or specific type of symptom that's associated with that damage. Now, in cases you're going to be looking for spots, and we'll look at what, what some spots might look like. Patches, circles, or rings can uh, help you eliminate uh, some other type of diseases that do not form these type of distinct symptoms with irregular shapes as well. We see the irregular shapes with a lot of our snow mold, gray or speckled type of snow molds. And then if we have any type of pattern, in a lot of cases, it's going to be some type of mowing or irrigation stress. Uh, in some cases, you may be actually spreading a pathogen on a piece of equipment, so it, it can be very useful to try to uh, identify what pathogen that might be, um, but still the pattern could be a good giveaway on that. Some examples of stand symptoms here. So symptoms that, again, are evident from a distance. Spots are going to be less than four inches in diameter. If you're looking at any reference materials, patches are irregularly shaped areas uh, that are greater than four inches in diameter. Circles would be obviously perfect, uh, perfectly circular areas uh, greater than four inches in diameter. Ring would be uh, a, a pad of healthy turf that is surrounded by a, a ring of of uh, infected turf, like that take-all take patch that we looked at there previously. And then regular, uh, obviously, uh, symptoms will have no type of pattern associated with that. Plant symptoms, so symptoms that are evident on individual plants. Uh, we can have many different types here. So leaf spots, either round or oval areas with distinct borders on those. Uh, foliar type of lesions would, instead of being a spot, uh, it would be actually an irregular type of area with a distinct border on the leaf blade. We can also have stem lesions as well. Full light or dieback or necrosis uh, it can certainly occur on leaves or entire tillers, and that might be specific to a, a particular disease that, that you're experiencing. Crot, so same thing, necrosis of crowns, uh, roots or stolons, and then certainly root rot as well can be another type of uh, plant symptom that we experience uh, in turf grass. Uh, here's just uh, you know uh, some picture examples of the difference between a stand symptom. In this case, we have dollar spot sclerotinia homeocarpa is the pathogen there, and these are uh, spots that are less than four inches in diameter associated with that particular disease. And here are the plant symptoms of this dollar spot. If you were to get down really closely and actually look at that turf, uh, you can see a lot of times from a dollar spot standpoint, 
these lesions are be considered an hourglass type of lesion uh, on our lesion blade. So very common with uh, the pathogen dollar spot. Here now we're, we're going to be uh, you know getting away from symptoms and looking for actual signs of a particular pathogen or its products. And a lot of these signs uh, could, you know are going to include evidence of that pathogen itself. So mycelium is, is we see quite often uh, associated with dollar spot or pythium is another disease. We see mycelium in the morning generally with a web-like uh, mass of fungal growth. We see spore masses on occasion from, uh, you know, uh, some type of smuts or uh, um, disease like that. Generally, it's a fuzzy or gelatinous uh, growth on our turf grasses. Frotties we can see as well, so spore, those are spore-producing structures. Sclerotia, often associated with our, our snow molds that we see. These are uh, very small, round, uh, and be thread-like structures as well. In the case with red thread, um, those would be uh, signs that the pathogen itself is actually present. Mushrooms are obviously uh, signs of uh, uh, structures being produced by a fairy ring fungus. And then we, and we also uh, identify insect signs by identifying that particular insect uh, on site. Uh, so an example of a sign that you might see of a particular pathogen in a home lawn, and this it's rust, which is uh, a species, um, and we can see that the rust, these are rust pustules or uh, uridinial spores on there. So that's a sign that the, actually the, the pin is present. Once we determine that rust is the issue here, uh, we can make recommendations of actually trying to eliminate some of that rust going forward. Here's a, a microscope shot of what those pustules look like, these reproducing structures, when they're coming out of a, of a leaf blade here. So this is the cross-section of leaf blade, and we can see those rust pustules actually coming out of that leaf blade there. That's a pathogen sign. Looking for some type of insect issue, I'll say, you know, sod webworm is probably one that we deal with, uh, in, you know, most in, in uh, you know, as our surface feeding insects go. Uh, you can use a soap type of flush to inspect for some webworms. So you can see a gentleman with a watering can here. He has a soap and water mixture. And what he's doing is pouring that mixture on the turf. Usually, a, you know, you might pick a square foot or a couple square foot area. You wait a, a couple minutes. And, and if you do have presence of any type of worm in that situation, cutworm, sod webworm, arm might be another issue you see. Uh, those worms should come to the surface because they do not like that soap solution. So. Uh, just a couple examples of what some of these forms might look like. Here's the mixture for that, uh, or the recipe for that soap solution process. So you're going to mix one to two fluid ounces of joy. You can use uh, lemon joy seems to work the best, or, or even lemon, you know, some type of lemon dishwashing detergent. Mix that with two gallons of water in a watering can or a bucket. Uh, pour or sprinkle that solution over uh, one square yard or square foot of turf. And observe, you know, for five to ten minutes, uh, if you have worms present, those, the worm larvae uh, will certainly come to the uh, surface. Oftentimes, I like to, to do this test in the morning. A lot of our worms, like the sod webworm, actually feed at night. Uh, probably not, you're going to have a hard time finding them at night, but they still may be a little bit active in the early morning, or at least they'll be very close to the surface there in the early morning is when I like to conduct uh, the process there. Four, inspect the site and ask questions. So this is checklist time. You know, this is when you're going through and filling out that checklist and making sure you're you're, uh, you're covering everything and asking all of the right questions. The checklist is going to include recent history of lawn care practices, uh, which are certainly going to be you know some type of applications. When did they apply fertilizer last? What kind of fertilizer was it? Did it have slow release nitrogen source in it at all? Um, have any pesticides been applied recently? What irrigation program? Do they apply any irrigation at all? Uh, have they conducted any seeding? Uh, what are their cultural practices? When did they aerate? Uh, how are their mowing practices? Um, weather patterns, certainly something to take note of here as well. And then also, I like to try to establish a timeline of when the issue occurred. Uh, was it there last year? Has it been continually growing in size here? When did it initially start? Uh, has, it, has it been decreasing in size? Uh, well, certainly all can help lead you to accurate identification 
try to identify some of your microclimates, and then are multiple grass species uh, affected? Be sure to take note of that uh, as well. Step, evaluate the soil physical characteristics. So this is where you're getting the soil probe or the soil profiler out. You're trying to determine, you know, is it very heavy soil, is it a sandy soil? You know, just roughly, uh, if you can determine that soil type based on some type of ribbon test. If you have a ribbon uh, you're forming in your hand and as you, you, know, if you have some moisture in the soil, and as you push that soil out between your index finger and your thumb, you should form some type of ribbon. If you have a ribbon that's in one inch, uh, generally it'd be a sand or a loam type of soil, or ribbon between one to two inches usually indicates a little bit more clay. Uh, one example would be a silty clay type of loam. If you have a ribbon that forms that's greater than two inches, a lot of cases this will be some type of clay soil, and just an example would be a silty, you know, silty clay type of soil there. Try to adjust the level of compaction as well by using soil probe there. Uh, what's the moisture status of the lawn? Uh, is the soil type consistent throughout the property? Is the particular issue they're experiencing simply on, uh, you know, simply confined to one different soil type that maybe was changed out in the past? I've seen that quite often. And they recently conducted a soil test. If not, you certainly might want to consider doing that uh, in, in the near future in situations. Step six, so synthesize that information, try to uh, break it all down, review the checklist, review the notes that you've made, consult your reference materials as well. Try to identify what the potential causes might be at this point in time. If you really can't get there, you know, definitely you have the option to try to converse with some colleagues or myself and solve that issue. I come with colleagues quite often to try to solve lawn care issues. Matter of fact, the picture on the right-hand side here, here the issue that I saw in, in three lawns here, this year, and the first time I saw it, um, it, it threw me for a loop. And I, I knew that, you know, definitely the green spots in this lawn, this is really dramatic here, but definitely the green spots in this lawn were associated with nitrogen. Um, and I, you know, wasn't overly aware that, matter of fact, that's how they fertilize trees uh, in all cases. So, uh, they've set out a grid pattern here, and they're augering a hole, and they're dropping some type of tree fertilizer spike in this lawn. And in the case of a lawn like this, where it was really lacking nitrogen fertility, we had a lot of that fertility actually released in these tree spikes. So it was meant to be fertilizing this tree here on the bottom right-hand side, and I assume the like a birch tree there on the top left. Um, so this is due to tree fertilization. I saw that in a couple situations here this summer. I didn't know the answer to it right away, so I put the picture out on Twitter and asked for some colleagues to chime in, and sure enough, they responded and said, um, they pointed me to a U of M publication where uh, you were recommending uh, that process for fertilizing the trees. So uh, I've seen that. A lot of cases, that's the issue uh, they're dealing with. And be sure you consult with the homeowner and make sure that, in fact, uh, that had a tree service come out there to fertilize their trees. If in this case they hadn't, that would still be trying. It would still be searching for the, the cause, but um, I, I don't know what else cause would be in that case. Uh, we're kind of running a little bit low on time. I was going to try to go through a scenario here, but I might just uh, just skip it, which is is certainly fine. Uh, skip it. I, I do have a step. Uh, I might have taken us 10 or 15 minutes or so, I suppose. But uh, a lot of our the diseases that we see, uh, the occurrence can be based on temperature. So if you're experiencing a disease in your lawn, uh, and that was the scenario that I had laid out there. You know, the first thing we started with in this scenario is it's early summer. So that gives you an idea of what the temperatures are, and that's always the place that I like to start if I really suspect that issue is a disease. Because if I determine what time that disease is occurring, I'm effectively eliminating at least 50% of the potential diseases that it could be. So cold weather diseases, you know, 32 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, snow mold, snow scald, certainly water and ice damage from the winter. We also have what I would call these cool weather diseases, 45 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, product ring spot, fairy rings, rust, uh, red thread, powdery mildew, some diseases that you might see in, in cool weather. We have warmer weather, we're going to start seeing more dust spot, uh, some brown patch on occasion, some leaf spots, and then the necrotic ring spot as well. Very weather situations where we see, you can see rapid loss of, of turf, uh, above 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Pythium, uh, something that we see quite often in that situation, summer patch, and then arachnosis as well can be another disease that we see on lawns in the heat of summer. And then obviously we have disorders uh, that are not linked 
of temperatures uh, as well. High nitrogen diseases, so here's, you know, baiting at the history of their fertilization applications, try to help to narrow down what, uh, what they might actually be encountering. Uh, we have five diseases that are very prevalent in high nitrogen situations, so if they put down a lot of fertilizer in the spring, summer, or fall, you might be seeing some of these. So brown patch, pythium, and the snowmobiles are all going to be encouraged by a, a fall fertilizer application, which is uh, certainly not something that we want uh, to, to encourage. And then all the gray leaf spot as well. We have a pretty good list of diseases that can be categorized as low nitrogen diseases. And oftentimes, to try to grow out of some type of disease, usually a fertilization uh, application would be recommended. So dollar spot, summer patch, necrotic cream spot, uh, tall patch, red red, and thracnose and rust would all be low nitrogen uh, type of diseases. Diagnosis for that case study that we just skipped over. Step seven, so consult the diagnostic laboratory if you're really stumped and you can't figure out what the issue is. Um, our plant disease clinic uh, does certainly does lawn care samples. They have a very similar checklist to be included in one of those links as well. The link to the Plant Diagnostic Clinic website is right here. Maybe Andrea can provide that as well for you in the chat box. It's just pdc.men.edu. Uh, uh, they usually guarantee a callback within 24 hours upon uh, receiving that sample and try to give you at least an idea of, of what issue you might be experiencing. Be sure to follow instructions for proper sampling. Uh, their analysis and their results are only good as the sample that they, they get to analyze. And then be sure you complete this submission form accurately. A lot of you know, what you write on the submission form helps them to determine what issue you might actually uh, be experiencing. And you know, in cases, it, it does not come back as a, a disease that you're experiencing, but uh, the diagnostic lab is very good at determining whether it's an antibiotic stress, uh, some type of pathogen, or some type of insect that's affecting the turf. So uh, that's really a good option for you. The last thing I'll leave you with here is, uh, you know, just uh, be a good detective. So uh, be sure you're asking the right questions and uh, be sure you're asking uh, plenty of questions so you have enough information to try to actually figure out uh, what, the, uh, what the issue is. Don't believe everything that you hear over the phone. Homeowners' understandings of what the issue is they're experiencing is, is not always accurate. Um, you know, sometimes I, I hear that uh, the disease is urgently growing and, uh, and find out that it was never a disease that you're they're dealing with in the first place. A lot of homeowners think they have clay soils when in fact they don't. So um, just don't believe everything that you hear. Take it all uh, you know, with a grain of salt until you actually observe the site for yourself. I that not every issue is a disease. In fact, most that we deal with are not. I suggest to look for soil or moisture issues to be the, the root, the root uh, no pun intended, of, of most of your problems. And then use only scientifically based resources for making recommendations. Try to stay off of the chat rooms and, uh, and the, the company websites when you're making recommendations on how to control a particular issue that someone is experiencing in, in a law. So, okay, uh, that's kind of what I have. Just some additional information here. Uh, well, some of our websites and uh, my contact information there as well. I think majority of you know how to get hold of me and what websites we use. So I hope everyone enjoyed that. At least it was probably, you know, a little bit informative for you of how I go through uh, diagnosing uh, turf disease issues, especially in lawns. I think we definitely have some time here if we want to take any questions. Uh, the group. Sam, that was really great information. And if you have a question, someone's already submitted. Okay. I have a circular witch's broom effect in the lawn grass. I have also have a ton of ants. Uh, would they be the vector for this, or should I look for some other cause? Ants are ants are just you know, nuisance. So they're they really not feeding on turf. They're not going to damage turf. The only ants actually damage turf is from the mounds that they create. So they're not feeding on turf at all. You have a circular patch of a witch's broom. A lot of cases, I would suspect that it would probably be a different species of grass. And the two that come to my mind would be either creeping bent grass or rough bluegrass that tend to form sort of patches and really kind of lay down 
And if you take a rake over them, usually they'll come up, you know, they, they'll kind of pull up and in, in, in a little bit of a clump because they're uh, stoloniferous grass. They have uh, uh, stolons that creep across the ground. So that would be my first suspicion. You aren't feeling your grass there, coming in your house, probably. Or in your yard, anyway. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right. Uh, so, anyone else have a question? Go ahead and type that in. So we'll give a little bit of time. And those links, those are uh, some pretty good links. Go ahead and print off the checklist and the questionnaires, even. Uh, try to use those when you conduct your site visits. Those can be a very, very important step in the process. And this as well, Andrea? Yes, this is recorded. Okay. Is there an evaluation uh, with this? or? Uh, so at the end of the webinar, another video will pop up um, that has a Qualtrics survey. Sure. Okay, nice. Well, if we don't have any questions, I appreciate everybody for being here. Uh, yeah, seeing any more, just some comments. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, if you have a copy of the presentation, feel free to email me as well. I'm happy to send that out. Oh, I did get one more question in. Okay. Uh, some grub killer now for Japanese beetles? We're really close to timing. Yep. Yeah, that was the time. That was the time. Did we say the first first week or, uh, um, of July? Uh, yep. So you're getting really close. I think you can go ahead and put it down this weekend. I don't know if I can type it in the chat here if everybody can see this when I type it in. It's uh, gdtracker.net. Um, there's a question there. So gdtracker.net. That's a website that's run by uh, Michigan State University. And that has growing degree days, uh, growing degree calculators for when to put down your pre emergent applications for crabgrass when to apply your preventative Japanese beetle grub applications as well. So that can be a very useful tool. I've not seen any more questions coming in, but again, comments, terrific information and presentation. So if you don't come up with a question later, send it to Sam and um, guys, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and be patient with us with the technology. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks. Bye.